Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sam Brusco, Associate Editor of Medical Product Outsourcing and moderator for today's program. You've logged on to the MPO webinar, Technical and Design Challenges Integrating Porous Membranes in Microfluidics. Before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. For those interested in the information you hear today once the webinar has ended, or if you'd like to forward it to a colleague, this session will be archived for a year. You can access the archive through the Medical Product Outsourcing website, which is at npomag.com. Also, we will be accepting questions throughout the presentation. You can type the question into the Q&A box in the webcast window. We will collect all questions and hold them until the end. But please feel free to type questions as you have them. And now, before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, Porex. Porex Corporation is a business of filtration group. Porex partners with customers in over 65 countries to deliver design innovation that turn product ideas into reality. Through a collaborative engineering partnership, Porex develops high-value porous polymer solutions to product design challenges in reflectivity, absorption, application, diffusion, filtration, venting, and wicking. The Porex Vertex PTFE membrane technology uses a patented and proprietary sintering process method to ensure a consistent and repeatable pore structure with no supporting layers needed. And now, let's get started. Today, we're joined by Dr. Leanna Levine, Dr. Stefano Bevelo, and Kayla Hutchison. Dr. Leanna Levine, founder of A-Line Inc., is an entrepreneur, technologist, and inventor. She has a unique blend of technical expertise in bioanalytical science and manufacturing process development. She conceived and developed A-Line's proprietary microfluidic platform and has seen the company through many transitions during the last two decades. Dr. Stefano Begolo, A-Line's key technical and business leader, has successfully led teams of engineers to manage several development programs in parallel during his tenure at A-Line. He has created and implemented business and operational strategies to enable A-Line's growth while spearheading the development of patented technology. Kayla Hutchison works in global product marketing for the PTFE business unit at Forex. She comes from a biotech and medical device industry background, seeing the commercialization of devices launched to market. As a subject matter expert in material sciences, Kayla works closely with customers and aims to make the world safer, healthier, and more productive with Forex. Now, let's begin today's presentation. Levine? Hi, everyone. This is Kayla Hutchison from Forex. I'm just going to jump in instead and say hello. Uh, thank you again for joining this webinar. We're really, really excited to bring you this time with um, A-Line, with um, Stefano and, and Liana. Um, so today we're discussing the technical and design challenges integrating porous membranes and microfluidics. So as mentioned, this webinar is presented together with A-Line Inc. and Porex. Um, in, uh, in microfluidics, we like to say that microfunctions make a big difference, especially when your goal is sensitivity and accuracy in these diagnostic applications. Um, so the science behind microfluidics, um, as we know, is the precise, precise control and manipulation of small amounts of fluids. So surfaces and materials dominate those volumetric forces. So porous polymers plays a large role. That's where porex comes in. Um, and then understanding the science and the physics of fluidic bioanalytical systems in order to bring ideas and concepts to scalable solutions then requires a partner. That is where Alain comes in with their scientific and engineering expertise um, that they give their customers to set to large-scale manufacturing. So we have come together to bring you this webinar, um, an innovator and designer's dream for the next you know, 20 to 30 minutes for these technical and design challenges, including 
the material-based expertise. So why are we talking about materials in microfluidics? In the microfluidic regime, surface area to volume is huge, making surface properties of materials an important component of any design function. Um, so the different functions can be enhanced through the use of those surface properties, including the hydrophilicity or hydrophobicity when um, using those liquid solutions, which are typical in these life science applications, right, like your reagents, your buffers, and so forth. Um, so we're going to dive into this today, um, look at some of the components of that, look at some case studies, um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to take away some great information today um, learning this application area within microfluidics. So um, Dr. Liana will take it around next. Um, to understand the role of microfluidics is probably a really good starting point. Hello, this is Liana Levine from AY. Um, what I wanted to discuss here is to give context for what we'll be talking about in the rest of the presentation. And particularly in diagnostic applications, the microfluidics really serve as kind of the, the fluid circuit board for holding and delivering and uh, executing the workflows that are necessary for a particular assay. So developers can choose two paths for development. Either you can have active control of the consumable, which is shown in the uh, cartridge on the far left. Uh, this would involve having a consumable with onboard calibration to achieve the greatest precision and accuracy. Or in the middle uh, picture on this slide, uh, passive control of the microfluidics through capillary action, typically for semi-quantitative analysis. Um, Typically, and particularly in point-of-care diagnostics, cost constraints for that single-use product is rather uh, high. So the least cost of goods is important to meet the business objectives in the marketplace. So divining, designing devices that use standard manufacturing processes are preferred. And so that means that the geometries and the channel sizes are typically greater than 250 or 500 microns making them compatible with most standard manufacturing processes. Uh, but the other regime where people work in microfluidics is shown in the pictures on the far right. So those are uh, an examples of droplet generators uh, with the picture below showing droplets being formed uh, it, it with a close-up image. In, in these types of microfluidic devices, the geometry of the channels imparts the function. Uh, and this typically happens in the regime below 100 microns. So for example, these droplet generators uh, have feature sizes that are smaller than 100 microns in any direction. Um, so membranes also play a role in several of these functional requirements. And they can be integrated into these devices in a number of ways. Um, Kayla is going to describe some of the different function of membranes in the next slide. Hey, so we sort of use that expression um, in your micro functions make a big difference in microfluidics. Um, and that porous polymers play a large role in that. So when I say integrating porous membranes into microfluidics, what do I mean? Porous polymers are a solution in diagnostics. Um, they will filter, vent, wig, and so on and so forth. And those are adopted into components in these microfluidic devices and set up. Um, so we'll explore that a little bit more in this webinar. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Stefano uh, to describe a little bit more on the kind of characterization and terminology we tend to see with these media and membrane materials, uh, which they have really great experience um, adopting with customers into those device types. Hello, this is Stefano from A-Line. I mentioned there are many use cases in microfluidics here, uh, depending on the type of mass used. Uh, so in the class, uh, functions uh, I look at is the porous membranes. Uh, They're um, typically used for containment of cells, uh, resistors, or barrier for bacteria in microfluidic flow systems. These first three functions are actually highlighted in the first uh, uh, image on the left. Uh, it is a cartridge for cell culture 
uh, that's been developed in collaboration with NASA. Um, other applications include the separation of plasma from whole blood for sample preparation, for example, uh, using the air venting to fill channels, to meter fluid in microfluidy circuits, debubbling the fluids. Uh, those examples are shown in the second photo on the on, from the left, uh, which are, we are going to look into more detail in the next slides. And other applications include the support of electrodes in gas detection. Um, other classes of membranes include the track edge membranes that can be used for uh, passive cell separation, for example, a, a sperm cell sorting, which is shown on the very far right on the bottom of the slide, or in the case of organ on chip and cell culture, to use uh, to have multiple chambers stacked one on top of the other to do to mimic the uh, the tissue uh, behavior in uh, in the organs to to do studies uh, uh, in uh, in terms of uh, development of new drugs or uh, new um, uh, mimicking of the or organs in uh, in the human body. Um, other examples include the use of porous media, such as sinter fibers and foams. Uh, these are typically used for liquid reagent storage, controlled delivery, vacuum drive of fluid circuit filling, and venting. And in the next couple of slides, uh, we're going to show some examples of how these uh, different uh, uh, components can be uh, combined together into a standard workflow. I'll leave it to Kayla to show the next uh, uh, example. Hey. So when we think of these solutions with the uh, porous membranes and media, in terms of those applications we looked at on the other slide, the venting, the wicking, the absorption. Um, this is what it would look like in a microfluidic device in um, a molecular uh, workflow, for example, and how those porous polymers play a role in each of those steps. So, for example, it might be of high importance to have a precise control and manipulation of fluid. So your material of choice comes down to characteristics of a membrane material, like pore density, pore size, porosity, and some of the performance characteristics we like to reference a lot, like airflow rate, water entry pressure limits, and, and coating options, and so on and so forth. So if we look to the um, debubbling and venting step, um, that's something I myself am quite familiar with. Um, in this example, it's, uh, say, as a venting component, it's a critical component in any microfluidic cartridge. So the material of choice that you're thinking of might, for example, be a hydrophobic scented option, like a PTFE material type, that look to repel outside fluids without additives, yet support a high airflow rate, and not allow leaking from liquids inside the device to outside. So those are the kind of performance measures that we're thinking about in terms of a step in a workflow. And selecting that right material is critical to the requirement and performance of that component um, and can sort of dictate how successful the sample liquids is filtered, whipped around, moved inside the device, and, and captured through to the, the detection zone. Um, so when we're thinking of those membrane materials, what's going to work best for you, you're going to look at elements like the porosity and density of that pore material to control functionalities like flow rate, flow direction, air flow rates, and so on and so forth. So in the next slide, we'll look at a few of those steps in a real life example um, that's presented by A-Line. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, the device you see on this photo is actually uh, a device that A-Line has developed as an example of the common steps in microfluidic diagnostics. So if you're thinking about a standard assay that needs to be implemented in a cartridge, you typically have uh, uh, some teams that come up very often. So the first one is the need for metering of, the, uh, of liquids. That's typically needed when you do quantitative or semi-quantitative measurements. And it typically has to require both for samples and reagents. You want to make sure you're using the right volume for the assay. Uh, this uh, typically needs to be mixed together to combine the sample and the reagents and also to maximize the interaction between the analyte and the capture agents or sensors. Uh, these first two, uh, two components typically tend to uh, uh, need the use of uh, uh, venting and uh, uh, the use of active mixing that might actually introduce uh, some type of bubbles in the system, and as we know, bubbles in microfluidics are really problematic. So um, one thing that is typically introduced in, in cartridges is the, is the use of debubbling uh, to remove bubbles present in the samples, and that's typically done using hydrophobic porous membranes that remove the bubbles from the fluidic streams before that gets dispensed uh, into the channel or chamber that is used for the final optical or electrochemical detection.
We can see now the device in action. Uh, at first, we have metering happening with the vacuum that pulls in the fluid to a stop to a vent membrane. Um, we now uh, are moving the fluids into the mixing chamber, and in doing so, we are using the onboard valves and the components that are developed using A-Lines proprietary technology. Um, the two liquids are now mixed together in order to really merge the two, uh, the two colors. And then after mixing, you can see a lot of bubbles are present. Those are being removed right now using vacuum that is applied uh, from a porous membrane. Um, and once all of the bubbles are removed, uh, the liquid can then be pushed into the detection chamber that is located on the top to do the dispensing. So after looking at a use case example of that molecular workflow in a microfluidic setup, uh, we would look at step number one of choosing those material types um, and whether it be a fiber option, a cinder option, a, a track edge membrane option, for example, we look back to these um, application and workflow steps. So again, we're looking at venting and those design features such as the amount of pressure in the system might help to determine that a male hydrophobic option of a cinder particle in the venting uh, set, like for example, a PTFE material might be a best fit other than um, other scented materials or, or other fiber or track edge membranes. So having an idea of those steps and characteristics um, kind of come into play when we're choosing the right material option then. So this is a uh, physical properties materials table um, that is actually a range of materials offered by Porex. Um, we play in the area of cinder particles bonded by this and track edge membranes, for example. Um, so uh, when you look at, say, the cinder material options, we describe this material type as a well-defined complex 3D geometry that makes a porous hydrophobic material suitable, for example, in the, in the venting or waterproofing for um, interesting in sealing or keeping fluids outside of the device. Um, the bonded fiber range, uh, we typically see in applications for wicking or in that sample intake set that's designed to control the liquid and volume speed. Um, so you might reference that as a conjugate pad, for example. Um, and an important factor is to sort of keep in mind, at least for the stinted particle uh, material types, is the pore size you might look to. And then for the fiber, you're looking at the pore volume and density as a key property. And then from there, you're looking at the materials and what properties that are important to you. So uh, just for reference, you know, when you're looking at that pore size, that information presented there is taken from a number of measures. So what we do is we take a bubble point testing method to determine the largest pore size in that porous media. And then we go to the mercury intrusion test to capture a medium pore size. So that's how we capture a range. And you would work with your supplier to work what determining actual tolerance rate you're looking for for the pore size that you're looking there. And we do the same for pore size volume, and densities, and so on and so forth. And then other uh, property applications, uh, sorry, properties that you're going to be looking at is, is the material um, and how it resists or is inert with chemicals um, and then the purity. And what I mean by that is um, when you're thinking of your sample reagents and buffer chemistries, those are particular fluid types. So um, you would want to look at a material that is um, chemically inert to those types of oils and surfacents. Um, and then in the purity column, we think of that as in um, uh, if there's an additive or a coating option that needs to be added to the material and, uh, to have a certain type of performance measure, um, is that going to be leaching into the system? So those are a few examples of properties of characteristics of materials that you would look to in order to choose what's best for the step or the application in your matrix. So we now want to look at strategies for membrane integration. There are typically two uh, ways we can integrate a membrane into a microfluidic cartridge. Uh, you can either go the route of using uh, uh, die-cut or, or laser-cut membranes that are heat-staked or adhesive bonding as an island placement, so a small, a small surface area of the, of the device is actually covered with the membrane. Examples are shown here in the left uh, with some of the culture, culture and organ-on-chip devices. Or you can, in, in alternative, you can use the lamination of the membrane sheet as a full 
surface area of the membrane. Uh, this is typically achieved with thermal or pressure sensitive adhesives. Uh, the choice of which strategy to apply really depends on the application. So it's something that uh, gets typically analyzed at the beginning of every development program, but there are pros and cons to each uh, that can be considered in this, uh, in this uh, integration step. Once the membrane is integrated into the, uh, the device, there are a few challenges to keep in mind. First one that we want to over oversee here is the uh, dead volume and the lamination. So whenever a membrane is introduced into a microfluidic stack, uh, there are thicknesses that need to be kept into account, and they can introduce dead volumes. A couple of examples are shown here in the schematics. And uh, um, another thing that can happen is that the membrane itself can induce the lamination between materials uh, between, because of, the, of its own thickness. Uh, and that can reduce the bonding quality. Uh, in order to mitigate this challenge, uh, we typically use the, uh, we typically try to minimize the thickness of the bonding substrate in the cartridge to reduce that, that volume below the membrane and uh, uh, introduce spacers shown in green in the schematics here uh, that can help compensate the membrane thickness and avoid that type of delamination. Um, another challenge that typically comes up as part of this integration is the use of mixed materials. Uh, that can induce the mismatching properties between the membrane and the substrate that can impact the bonding quality for welding, heat staking, or interfacing between the different materials. And uh, to mitigate that, uh, uh, one option is to use pressure sensitive adhesive to create a bridge between different materials and bond them successfully. Uh, if using welding or heat staking, uh, it's typically good to select a membrane and a cartridge material with similar properties. And this is where having a larger variety of options uh, on the memory materials so really comes handy, and so having a large catalog of, of, of membranes is really important here. Um, an alternative here is the use of sintered PTFE that allows in intrusion of the substrate polymer into the matrix using heat. You're basically creating an intimate contact between the similar material to really create a good bond between them. Other integration strategies that are used for, for uh, uh, membrane uh, integration into the into microfluidic device includes the use of uh, membrane stickers. Those are pre-cut membrane discs or smaller components with the integrated PSA that are then placed piece by piece into the microfluidic cartridges. Uh, a strategy that is commonly used here is try to combine these stickers or make them um, combine multiple functions in the same sticker to reduce the uh, piece by piece assembly step rather than having multiple stickers in the same cartridge. Um, one other strategy that is commonly used, especially in the development size, is the use of test modules for membrane selection. Uh, and so uh, we in this case, we typically use a sub-module with different membranes that can be used into a larger uh, fluidic motherboard or larger cartridge that can be reused for different applications. Uh, this allows screening multiple membrane options using a single microfluidic devices and avoiding having to build larger components uh, to test multiple materials. We'll see an example of that uh, uh, in a few minutes. Um, a third strategy that uh, comes in handy when is the use of uh, a multi-layer membrane stack uh, using lamination. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, it is possible to laminate multiple membranes using PSA or welding uh, to combine them together. And that typically allows you to integrate multiple functions, such as multi-stage filter or pre-filtering, uh, by minimizing the dead volume. An example here is shown in the schematics. Uh, and uh, um, this can be done either by stacking different membranes or using uh, uh, supported membranes, which allow a simplification of the integration. Uh, now we want to focus on uh, examples and case studies. So as we've seen before, there are many uh, different uh, components that, uh, tip and, and steps that get implemented into uh, microfluidic workflows. Uh, we're going to look at debubbling as the key, uh, as the key step uh, that, uh, um, that can be uh, used for some, uh, some case studies in the next slide. So then I'll give it back to Kayla for some more introduction on that uh, subject. So we look a little bit more into these air bubble occurrences as it's quoted that they are considered a large and common issue in a lot of these microfluid devices. Um, and they occur due to, especially in the point of care space, um, when you're handling and, and transporting that, um, the portability and shaking and tilting of those devices are creating bubbling, um, especially when looking at reagents and inserting those into these devices, bringing that liquid inside creates a lot of surface tension and irregularity, causing bubble occurrences. Um, all of the uh, thermal cycling and heating changes occurring in these devices causes pressure and therefore bubbling occurrences. And of course, the oxidation process with gases 
and the phase change uh, due to that increase in temperature causes nucleation of bubbles at the surface level. And this is sort of creating issues um, that we know um, with these uh, diagnostic applications uh, where those bubbles are trapping within reaction chambers and metering channels and causing bubble occurrences in those optical detection uh, areas, which is impacting quantitative measurements. Um, and then, of course, that bubble occurrence uh, through the use of temperature also causes uneven temperature distribution and additional pressure condition changes. And those bubble issues distort fluid flow, can cause damage at the um, cell if you're working with cells in these systems at the liquid gas interfaces. And it is also known to uh, purge those sample liquids and reagents out of those systems. So you're seeing some um, assault loss of sample uh, measurement there too. So at porous, um, being that we are a porous membrane material manufacturer. Um, a spoiler alert, membranes play a huge role in degassing. So we did opt to investigate a little bit more into that and we quickly looked to cited methods of uh, taking those bubble uh, occurrences out of these systems. You saw an example in a couple of the previous slides. But here's what we know. Um, uh, this is presented by Yang in a study in 20, uh, 2022. And uh, they discussed uh, some of these methods being, and I'll just quickly go through this, um, optical laser to force bubble occurrences out, using acoustic wave therapies to move bubbles and liquids through to regions, using air pressure gradient forces, and, and I've highlighted the next one here, negative pressure vacuum using porous materials as say vents for an example is one method. And then of course a more commonly known uh, way to remove bubbles um, uh, that you've probably seen and heard of is those passive me methods, so those bubble trap regions that are only truly using um, capillary action and gravity to uh, move bubbles through to uh, those bubble trap areas. Um, and when we think of those negative pressure vacuum setups using porous materials, there's a couple of additional ways to do that, and I've highlighted four here. Um, so you can do it active or passive driven. So passive meaning there's no external components. Active meaning there is, like the vacuum setup. Uh, there are the channel surface structures, so a layering of materials uh, that Stefano covered in, in one of those slides there. And then of course we have standalone components um, referenced as inline debubblers. And each of these sort of have a lot of sided shortfalls. Um, and quickly, you know, when you think of laser, those uh, vaporizing of those liquid samples actually can create more bubbling. Um, in acoustic, uh, the ultrasonic frequency can actually damage cell membranes. At the air pressure method, uh, we have a few geometric limitations. Um, so the limitations with the negative pressure vacuum using the porous material is the capacity to add uh, some of those components onto your footprint. And uh, the most common sh shortfall of these passive elements um, might be maybe a longer time to degas um, or needing a model geometry design to sort of facilitate that. So um, of course, being a uh, manufacturer of porous materials, we're going to talk a little bit about that negative pressure vacuum system using a porous material in an active pressure system in order to su uh, successfully degas. So that is where we started. So what's the science behind it? How does it work? Um, using a vacuum above the membrane surface, the fluid pressure causes those bubbles to migrate towards the membrane surface. And due to the surface tension of the membrane being, say, a hydrophobic membrane, uh, it causes the fluid around the bubble to break on that microporous rough surface of the membrane, allowing air to pass through and uh, being a microporous membrane material type, that sample liquid is not bypassing or letting out through the material and is staying with, uh, on the inside. Um, and how those hydrophobic membranes are evaluated, um, we uh, spoke with A-Line Inc. and we were able to, they were able to devise a cautious design for us to test this with. This is what we're interested in looking at. Um, and we wanted to show the ability of those bubbles being removed out of the system using a hydrophobic porous membrane like porous vertex PTFE. 
And what makes a uh, hydrophobic porous material like PTFE suitable in degassing application? We might quickly look to the process of how it's made um, to understand a little bit more about those scented medias. So how this works is we take the raw PTFE resin, think of it as marbles, into a vessel. And we're using a um, sintering or cooking method with pressure to create a solid billet material that we scut, uh, uh, scide or cut into sheet uh, materials um, that makes a scented media um, membrane material, which as you can see from this cross-sectional view, this is um, PTFE from top to bottom. We describe it a depth filtration media. So that just means those um, uh, uh, poured or marbled uh, um, pure PTFE creates a micro-porous omnidirectional pore structure that allows air to pass through and will capture particulates or liquids through the membrane surface. So once the membrane is, uh, is produced, so then uh, 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 there are multiple options and different configurations that can be tested. So in order to optimize and select the right membrane for the application, uh, here is an example of how the process of optimization is implemented. Uh, in, this, in this study, uh, we were able to uh, use the, and leverage the A-Line platform technology uh, to really help uh, the uh, down selection of multiple PTFE membranes uh, and characterizing their, their behavior. So in order to do that, uh, we have used a device that is actually made of three components. So the bigger one that you see in the photo and on the first schematic on the left uh, is the actual microfluidic cartridge. It includes uh, the, the microchannels, the pumps and valves that are used to actually produce the flow and, and tightly controlling uh, the flow rate of both gas and liquid using integrated uh, onboard, uh, onboard valves and pumps. Uh, this, uh, uh, this channel network also includes the use of a T-junction that is shown in the center that is used to actually produce the bubbles in a controlled way so that we can really check uh, how the, um, the bubbles are produced and really mimic what happens in a, in a, in a normal configuration, in a microfluidic configuration. And then the third module that's shown on the very right uh, is uh, basically a debubbler that includes a, a microporous membrane uh, in PTFE and uh, uh, on one side, we have the fluidic channel where the liquid and the bubbles are passed through. And on the other side, there is a vacuum applied to really remove only the gas and allowing the liquid to go through and pass through the system. Uh, using this test bench, uh, we were able to characterize multiple membranes uh, uh, using membranes with, with different airflow, different water entry pressure, and not only demonstrate that uh, the wide range of PTFE membranes allowed all of them to remove bubbles, uh, from the fluid stream, but also we were able to characterize their, the, the vacuum range that needs to be applied uh, in order to get a successful uh, process. And in the next slide, we're going to see this uh, uh, device in action. So this slide shows the device in action. Uh, you can see in the video on the right that bubbles are being produced on board inside the device. Uh, using uh, onboard valves and pumps uh, to generate a fluid stream of liquid and air, and then alternatively creating this uh, sequence of uh, plugs of liquid uh, with uh, air in between. And uh, as soon as they reach the uh, vented membrane on the left side of the device, uh, they have removed uh, through the uh, porex vertex PTFE membrane, and uh, so that only the fluid, uh, the red fluid, actually makes it to the end uh, on the output of the device. <laughs> You can see in this video uh, the bubble trap in action. So we, we are currently using three out of the 12 total uh, channels um, with, with the multiple colors, so blue, red, and green. Uh, fluid streams are coming from the left that include large bubbles uh, between the plugs of liquid. Uh, and as soon as the, uh, the, the air makes it inside the uh, bubble trap, uh, the, uh, it's been removed from the fluid stream using the porous membrane and the vacuum applied um, uh, from the from the bubble trap, so that only the fluid really makes it out uh, and into the system. Uh, one thing to note about this is that uh, um, the selection of the membrane was really uh, used uh, was, was really performed using the uh, the approach we described before by using different membranes and verifying which one uh, was best in terms of back pressure and uh, avoiding leaks. And uh, right now, this system is produced using. Uh, uh, PSA integration, but uh, uh, we are looking into the opportunity of uh, using sintered porous material and heat staking to re reduce the complexity and reduce the final cost.
Thank you, Stephanie. Um, this is probably a really great point to sort of wrap up. Um, you know, looking at those case studies kind of shows the capabilities um, partners like a -Line Inc. have with customers to sort of mitigate a lot of those challenges that we discussed throughout this webinar of um, liquid matrices and microfluidics and, and uh, issues like challenges of, uh, of bubbling in those systems. Um, so it kind of comes down to how you work in partnership um, and how we do that with customers. Um, and bringing in um, suppliers like Porex and subject matter experts like Alainik. Um, and how you do that and how you get started is important. Um, and we look to questions like these. Um, so this is some information you might want to have ready to begin a discussion with um, partners like Alainik or Porex. And that includes, you know, what is the application or use case? What kind of molecular setup are you looking to achieve? Um, in terms of performance requirements, are you looking for speed, volume? This is going to help us identify the density of the material or what material or, or setup is going to work. And then what are the critical functional requirements? Is it to meter? Is it to wash? Um, you know, what is the detection method you're using? Um, that information is important. And then, of course, who is the uh, end user for your device and where is it used? That comes into the cost constraints the type of instrumentation, uh, instrumentation and complexity that we're going to um, have and be involved with in that conversation. And then, of course, constraints and barriers that you're working up against. We like to know that, too. Um, that's going to have a play at uh, the type of discussion that we're having. So this is where we wrap up. I just want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Liana and Dr. Stefano for coming here with a -Line Inc. Um, to be a subject matter expert uh, with Porex um, to discuss a lot of these challenges. Uh, our goal here today was you know, to get you a little bit more familiar with the successes that we see of using porous materials and these device types. Um, and we are only truly just focusing on one of the niche areas of that bubbling challenge that we see in microfluidics. Um, but there's so much more involved in this topic of conversation. And having a partner like A-Line Inc. is imperative um, uh, to working for a solution and taking it into that commercial setting. Um, so thank you, Liana and Stefano, for joining us here today. Um, I think the information presented here was exactly what we're looking to do. Um, and for those listening in today, thank you for making it through um, the time here. Uh, as mentioned, any questions that you have, we'd love to resolve with you. Anything we can't answer, um, we'd love you to get in contact with us and ask a question, set up a conversation. And you can do that by visiting our website. Um, uh, Airline website is listed here alongside with Porex. You can email us directly. Um, and a lot of the resources and information um, that was presented here today is also um, in and around both of our websites. a Inc. has a great resource page um, with the topic of microfluidics and all of the case studies that they get involved with. Um, and Porex, we like to showcase our materials um, and provide information of what's necessary when starting that process, that first step. Um, so do visit. Um, and do please provide any questions with love for you to walk away having an answer to the, the question that was studying. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for that thorough and informative presentation. Once again, don't forget that this webinar will be archived on mpomag.com for a year. Now we're going to get to our question and answer session. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Leanna, we're going to direct this first question to you. Uh, someone asks that whether or not they can cast a membrane directly onto their microfluidic chip. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's actually something that we attempted to do probably 15 years ago. Um, I think the issue with trying to do that is that if they pretty involved research project and getting consistent properties might not make it cost feasible, especially for a low cost consumable product. Uh, one of the things that happens when you cast membranes is they shrink 
So if you cast them into uh, an opening, they're going to pull away uh, as the polymer precipitates to form the porous structure. Uh, so I think it's better to use an engineered porous product where the properties are very well understood uh, rather than trying to focus on developing um, a new process. All right. Very good. Thanks. Uh, we're going to shoot this next question over to uh, Stefano, actually. Uh, we have a request to uh, elaborate on how the metering happens exactly. So would you mind uh, elaborating for us, please? Sure, yeah, we didn't go into too much detail because of time constraints, but uh, basically the approach that is used for filling the channels that are shown in uh, uh, slide nine uh, are really, is really focused on the use of uh, vacuum and uh, a hydrophobic porous membrane. So the device itself, the M2D2, has a porous membrane throughout the whole surface of the device. And uh, as we uh, want the fluid to enter the channel, so we're basically applying a vacuum to evacuate the air through the membrane and filling the, the channel completely with the liquid. Awesome. Thanks for the elaboration. It sheds a lot of light on it. I appreciate it. As do our listeners. <laughs> Uh, we're going to keep things even here and shoot the next question over to you, Kayla. Um, someone asks, what temperature is used to sinter the PTFE particles? And they ask whether or not they can sinter the particles directly onto their polymer chip. Yeah, so um, the sintering temperature for PTFE uh, is around 350 to 450 degrees Celsius. Um, we like to reference, um, just for ease, that PTFE will withstand up to 260 degrees Celsius continuous. Um, but maybe more, that question was more related to the heat welding, um, so how you might apply PTFE and heat weld it onto your microfluidic chip, for an example. Um, I know there was another question there um, about the assembly options, so I can answer these two questions in one, actually. Um, so the way heat thermal and ultrasonic welding will occur with PTFE because it is such a high temperature melting point. Um, we like to classify that as a, as a high performance material type like PTFE. Is the actual, uh, what's occurring is the melting temperature of the chip housing material is actually what will melt first. And that will melt into the pore structure of the PTFE. The PTFE is not melting, it is not, um, changing in structure at all, you're actually creating a permanent bond um, by um, thermal and heat welding the chip housing material into the PTFE. Um, so that's how you would uh, assemble a PTFE onto a microfluidic chip, for an example, if you're using heat weldering. Um, but like I mentioned, you might not um, be uh, casting that directly, casting the PTFE material um, onto that microfluidic chip, as Liana described previously as well. Yeah. Oh, very good. Thanks so much for the explanation. Um, we're going to stick with you on this next one, Kayla. Um, someone indicates that they don't want their waste bag to exceed uh, 0.5 psi, um, and uh, they're asking if there's a membrane that vents air when pressure increases above 0.5 PSI and closes when it's less. Yeah, so it's my understanding that the question surrounding they have a waste bag or a collection region, um, and they're using quite low PSI pressure as an internal condition in their microfluidic chip. For example, um, this is a great discovery question. This is something um, I would always advise you to get in contact with us. We have a great team who loves discussing these technical challenges with you. Um, so I would invite you to contact us and ask that question directly as you posed it. But what I can answer really quick, um, and we looked at it really quick on a previous slide when we we're looking at um, using PTFE in the gassing in microfluidic chip setup using a vacuum system to using a vacuum placed on that membrane. It degassed successfully at a range of 0 0.5 PSI to 12.4 PSI. Um, so it does go down to a low pressure condition, um, but if you're looking for a passive option, um, there's more time involved to likely degas through that membrane. 
Um, and there's likely some other scented options um, that might be an option for you to um, uh, we like to call it self-sealing technology. Um, so let's get in touch. Let's ask that question. We can describe it more together. Very good. And as as you all can see, uh, all the contact information is is on the slide right in front of you. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any other questions that we don't get to today. Um, so I'm going to volley uh, back to A-Line for this question. Um, so you showcased uh, bubbling as a common issue and some functional ways to mitigate the issue. Uh, what what changes are there when uh, using a device in a commercial setting, and what well, like what other components might be needed? So either Stefano or Leanna, who, whoever wants to answer that. I can take it. Uh, uh, this is Stefano. So yeah, this is a great question. Uh, definitely, bubbling is a critical. Uh, um, bubbling is a critical component that uh, typically shows up in most of devices. So that's why we kind of like highlighted that uh, as the uh, as the example for this presentation. Uh, if I have to think about like every application is different, but in general, uh, what typically happens is that there is a need for. Uh, when you commercialize a product, there's typically a sample that comes from uh, a bodily fluid or some external uh, external uh, collection system that uh, will require some type of sample preparation. Uh, this could be, for example, the need for uh, plasma filtration if you're using a blood uh, blood sample. This could be uh, um, other types of filtration for saliva or other mediums that requires uh, taking out any type of particles or other components that might actually interfere with the downstream analysis. And uh, uh, in some cases, when you're doing molecular tests, for example, uh, there might be a need for uh, DNA or RNA extraction uh, to make sure that we are removing any contaminants that might end up uh, um, like uh, inhibiting the downstream amplification and detection. So all of these components typically tend to require some type of um, of membrane and they tend to create bubbles and so that's why we actually decided to focus on the bubbling because it's something that normally happens as this uh, this is uh, uh, included into a commercial device. All right, very good. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, the explanation, Stefano. Um, so it looks like somebody asked whether or not they could get a copy. Uh, as, as I explained earlier, um, this webinar will be archived on mpomag.com for a year, so if you'd like to view it again or show it to your friends, uh, you can just go on there to find it. Alrighty, so unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's presentation. Uh, a little further information, A-Line will be hosting an open house uh, to celebrate a new facility. It, it just opened uh, the week of December 12th. There will be more details to follow. So, closing, I would like to thank our presenters for their insight. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Corex, for its support. Um, and, oh, and uh, as I forgot to mention, uh, the presentation is also available below, available below in the resources uh, section of this. But anyway, yes, uh, thank you, Corex, for your support. Thank you, the viewer, for attending this session. And I hope you found it to be a very valuable experience.